you know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at keeleycompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Today, you are in for a treat. You're in for one of the finer speakers, business owners, television stars, and human beings I've ever encountered. And after you hear his story, you're going to feel the same. I think you'll know his name, Willie Robertson. Willie Robertson is a remarkable example of entrepreneurship and dedication built on hard work, on faith, and on family. Serving as the CEO of Duck Commander and Buck Commander, he's also the star, this is where you know him, of A&E's Duck Dynasty. Willie has expanded his family companies from a living room operation to a multi-multi-million dollar enterprise. With destinations and things to do outdoors, he's an awesome business leader. He's a great storyteller. Today, Willie is going to share how his father, Phil, overcame the shadows of his past, and they are mighty, to achieve an unexpected redemption. We'll talk about their journey from profoundly humble beginnings to building a corporate empire built on faith and family. He's going to make you laugh. He might make you cry. He'll probably make fun of me, which is always a good thing. You'll love that. But you're going to end up not only loving him, but loving the potential, the possibility, the promise within your life, my friends. So whether you are familiar and a lifetime a viewer of Duck Dynasty or you've never heard of it before, you're going to love this humorous, redemptive, brilliant conversation with my friend and now yours. His name is Willie Robertson. Willie, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. What is up? Man, life and hope after you join me on this podcast. And I can't wait for our listeners and our viewers to hear a little bit more about your heart and your story and your testimony. But for the two listeners who may not know who you are and they may not recognize you by your beard, by your life, if you were to bump into them in an airport and they said, Willie Robertson, his name sounds familiar, man. Tell me about you. How would you answer that question? Well, <laughs> Ironically, I get that a lot. It literally once a week, someone will. Uh, in fact, I just had this happen. It was at the bank, and she goes, "You walked in, and I, and you look just like th that Doug Dynasty guy." Now this is in West Monroe. Okay, <laughs> this is five minutes from my house, and I said, "Yeah, I get that all the time." And she said, "Yeah, you look like the one Willie." And I said, "Oh wow, yeah, I hear that a lot." And I did my stuff, and I left the bank, and I, I never even told her. Uh, <laughs> I sat by a guy on the plane two weeks ago, and he said, "Yeah," he said, "I'm going to West Monroe." He said, "My cousin lives down here." He said, uh, "They live by where the Duck Dynasty people live." Do you know where that's at? And I said, "I do. I know exactly where that's at." And we had this whole conversation, and then finally he says, "So, what do you do for a living?" And I said, I sell duck calls, and and that's when he knew. So I think that's what I would tell people. Sometimes I play with it a bit, and sometimes I like them not knowing. Go into a store um, about 30 minutes from here. I was hunting. I came in. I had camouflage on, and she said, God, you look just like one of those Duck Dynasty guys. And I said, I know. I hear that a lot. And she goes, I mean, you look just like them. And I said, yeah, I, I hear that a lot. And she goes, well, I know one of them. And I said, oh, who do you know? And she said, Willie. And I said, really? And then I couldn't help myself, John. I was like, because this is rare when you get this opportunity in life. And I go, what's he like? 
And so, because I wanted to hear what I was like, and <laughs> and she said, "Oh, he's cool." And I said, "Oh, it's great to hear." Sometimes, you know, you don't you hear something <laughs> different. And I walked out of that store, and I didn't tell her who I was, and she didn't realize she was talking to one of her really good friends, so that she thought, but it was actually. <laughs> One doesn't know. I'm just a duck call seller from West Monroe, which is a town. And uh, yeah, I had a TV show for five years. We were on the air. We did 130 episodes, Duck Dynasty and on A&E. And um, yeah, and it lives on. It's still on TV all around. It was fun. Fun run. Willie, you and I had a fun run speaking at a, a shared stage. We spoke with Dave Ramsey's group down in, in Nashville. And you and I, man, uh, had the honor of joining a whole bunch of big name speakers and authors and folks like that on the stage. But I, I only asked one of them to join me on the podcast and, and it is you. And that humble, beautiful heart that people have already picked up on is what I picked up on while we were together live at dinner, while you were on stage and then afterwards in every conversation. So dude, I'm, I'm excited to unpack that. And normally when we bring folks onto the show, it starts with their story. And it starts with, what was life like for you growing up? But in order for folks to really understand that, we've got to go back one more generation. So I, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about your dad. Uh, okay, talk about hang your on, dad's... John. You, you said a lot there, and I have to go back. We were together at Dave Ramsey's thing. That was a fun thing. So many things came out of that. Uh uh, one of the best was actually meeting you and actually following up and doing this. I don't know if you were nervous, but I was nervous because Dave put me, I was in between Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> and Jordan Peterson, and then there's Willie Robertson. And so you ask about my story. I have a degree. I, I do have a, de a college degree, which I'm really proud of, but my degree is in, it's, it's I'm non-certified to teach PE degree. And so I know your listeners are, are probably going to try to Google that because you don't understand why would you get a degree in PE, but you can't teach PE. Like I still can't legally in the state of Louisiana teach a PE class, which is a very simple class. You roll some balls out. You say, hey, get after it. I can't teach that. Like six years it took me to get a degree and I can't even teach that. And so Ramsey slides me in there in between these super intelligent dudes. Yeah, that was a fun conference. I was uh, grateful Dave asked me. And that was about business, um, which to circle back to your question about my dad, which is how I got into the business was my dad uh, started Duck Commander and selling duck calls in 1972, which is actually the year I was born. So I like to think of it like the company started when I was born. He saw me and was like, you know, actually, I don't even think he saw me. I don't even think he was there when I was born. I'm pretty sure he wasn't. And so I was born. and But that's when he kind of had the idea to build a duck call. And as life turned, I, I never thought I would be in this business. When I was a, a teenager, I was like, when I get out of here, I'm out of here. I'm going to do something completely different like non-certified to teach PE degree. <laughs> I was like, I knew I was going to be somewhere, but I never dreamed I would be at Duck Commander with the family business selling anything uh, with them. But I came back when I was like 30 years old and was like, hey, I think dad's got something really cool here, you know, and so maybe I can take it over. So once I got a little more mature, I came in, was able to take the business over. And then, and then that's when the opportunity came to do the television show, which was my wife's idea. We did that. And Yada, 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 here we are. So dude, I've, I've, you've made me cry already four times, this time though out of joy and laughter. So it's mission accomplished already. And you've completely danced around the one question I've asked you so far, which was tell oh, us about your dad. <laughs> so now Willie, your dad started this business. He raised a few kids, you're being one of them. And if people knew his background, they would be shocked at what he's become in his life subsequently. Well, I tell you what, they're going to have a great opportunity to learn his background <laughs> because we have a movie coming out. September 28th is when the movie comes out. It's called The Blind, and it is about basically my mom and dad's life before they found their faith, which was very dark and very tragic. And then they find their faith, and then life completely turns around. And so we we went all the way back to a little bit of his childhood and how he grew up and my mom grew up. This is in Northwest Louisiana, very poor. At least my dad was, my mom wasn't. There was mental illness in the family. My grandmother was mentally ill, which was a struggle. And she wasn't 
con she would have these uh we would call them granny's got a spell but i don't know like she would just go on these things and she would be really really off and so they'd have to take her to the institution she'd come back and she was very instrumental in my life as far as helping raise me and um uh, she was great but we 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 look at that a little bit and then phil ends up going to uh louisiana tech on a football scholarship where he plays football he's the starter and his backup is is terry bradshaw which is that's a true story and and terry says uh to this day had phil kept playing football and had, had they been the same age or in the same class uh terry says he never would have he never would have gotten on the field and just so your viewers know Bradshaw 1970 was the number one draft pick from out of college, which is which is kind of amazing out of Louisiana Tech, small school, and goes on, you know, to win Super Bowls and still on. I watched him yesterday on television with covering football. And so Phil ends up giving up football. Um, he still got his degree. He got you end up getting his master's degree. And so this guy has all this talent. He's pulled himself out of the you know, the poverty that he grew up in. He and Kay are married, sort of. I still can't figure out all the, the details. I know mom was pregnant in high school. And uh, so anyway, he's got a family. They moved to Southern Arkansas. He's going to teach school. And then his life just completely goes down the toilet. He is living in just a crazy, wild living life. He's He's not a good husband. He's an adulterer. He's fighting all the time. He ends up losing his job. He ends up running a bar, which is that's where he I guess he thought he was going to end up in life. And, you know, the way I look at it, it was kind of just like wasted talent. Like Phil had a lot of talent. He's smart and gifted athlete and great personality, but just kind of threw it all away. It was the he was drunk all the time. And so he was just a terrible guy. And so he ultimately kicks out my mother and, and three kids at the time. I was the youngest. He kicks us out of the house and um he ends up being pursued by law enforcement. Uh, he lives in the woods for months. I think six months he actually lived in the woods, off the grid, hiding from the police. Uh, and mom ends up moving to, to to Louisiana. That's how we actually got here is she moved down. And I think she never thought she was going to see dad again. I mean, I think she, this thing was over. But dad had a sister who was very religious and just never gave up on her brother. And and she had this vision, John. She was, so she went to this preacher here in West Monroe and said, will you please go talk to my brother? He needs the gospel. He needs something in his life. And I, I just could imagine how the conversation went where I'm sure the preacher was like, yeah, bring him to church. <laughs> and she's like, he, he's not coming to church. Uh, where's he at? He's at a bar. Where's that at? It's in another state. You're going to have to drive, you know, across state lines. And and this preacher sure enough takes her up on it, goes up there and actually shares his faith. And this is in the movie where, where, and Phil is very adversarial. He is not happy about this. He does not. But she told that preacher, she said, if you convert this guy, he'll convert thousands. And how she knew that or could see that was really amazing because you really, I don't know what you could see in his life that mm. would have predicted that in any way. And so the movies, it's hard. It was hard for us to watch. I think in life, we've all had things that we have gotten through and there's stuff that, you know, dark times and sinful times. And so I think the spirit of Christianity is like, hey, your past is your past and it's over and we look forward and we don't look back. And so I think generally in life, whether you're religious or not, is a good principle of us to look forward, not backwards, unless they make a movie about it <laughs> where it lives forever in this time. And so I'm so thankful that mom and dad were, were willing to share that story and open up because they thought if it can help others and marriages that are on the rocks, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of hope. It's a story that, Hey, you're never too far gone. And uh, it wasn't until Phil was literally out in the woods and at the end of possibly his life, you know, uh, the way he was living is where he finally humbled himself and said, maybe I should try what that preacher said. He told me this crazy story, you know, about faith and about Jesus. And so he comes back and, and I actually then asked for forgiveness for my mom. And uh, the story is about Phil, but it's it's probably more about my mom and just mm -hmm. her steadfastness and her willingness to forgive dad and take it all back. Because had that not happened, had, had, had they not reconciled and stayed together, had my dad not changed his life, literally going forward, which is close to 50 years now, Nothing would have played out the same. In fact, all the way to right now in this moment, I wouldn't be on this podcast because there wouldn't have been a Duck Commander, which right. wouldn't have been a Duck Dynasty TV show. I wouldn't have been asked by Dave Ramsey, assuming to talk at his 
conference. I wouldn't have met you. And so, man, I can look back and uh, you can like spiritually 23 of me this thing and go like, I can trace it back to a couple. I can trace it back to a guy who got in a car and drove to a bar mm. to share his faith with someone. And none of this looked like, if you just said, hey, this is going to impact, it's going to have ripples all across the world for the next, you know, in 50 years from now, there'll be people in Brazil or people in Europe being exposed to this. That I, I don't know how you could have seen it ever happen, John. It's just, it's unbelievable. And I can trace it back. So that's why faith is so important to me and to us as a family, because without it, none of this would have happened. The family wouldn't have stayed together. I would have, I would have been raised in a single home. Uh, single parent home, which is again, I mean, God can fix a lot of mistakes, and but I know the path that it took wouldn't have happened that way. And so, well, God, we're just so blessed, so thankful to God for what He did. Thankful to my mom for being able to forgive, and I'm thankful for my dad for being able to say, "Hey, you know, I've got to make some changes in life." And I think all of us at some point had probably had to do that. Just said, "Look, I'm, I'm not going the right way," <laughs> you know. And so, and somebody's like, "If you keep going this way, you're gonna." destroy yourself and so that's what the movie's about it's called the blind it's it's a double meaning where phil was blinded for sure but also in the hunting realm we sit in blinds and we're trying to be camouflaged to the animals that we're after we produced it ourselves and um it was a little fun i learned a lot making a movie it's a lot different than making tv and so we learned a lot but super proud of it and just can't wait for people to go see really? it i guess it's considered a a faith-based movie, but it's, there's watching the movie, there's not a lot of faith in it until the end, until it actually comes around. So it's a little bit tougher to watch. But yeah, we've seen a lot of success with other movies that have just good stories that are inspiring. And so that's why we got into the production business because we saw the impact that Doug Dynasty had. We had so many people say, we love shows like this. We need shows that inspire, that have good messages, that are wholesome. And so uh, Corey and I just decided, hey, man, let's let's attempt, not just for us, not to, for us to be on it, but for other people to make, mm. tell their stories. And, and there's tons of stories out there to, to be told. Well, it's a powerful one. And it led to you and I having this conversation and it gave you someone to look up to, a, a father that you wanted to be more like. And you've become more like, and it's pretty cool, not only in faith, but also as an entrepreneur, as a business leader. And that started early, Willie. I think you know where this is going, man. One of the things you shared on stage, and I think it's a, a riot, is some of the jobs you had as a kid outside of working in your dad's business. You became an entrepreneur outside of the business. W would you guide us through a few of the jobs you had as a kid in fourth and fifth grade? So I learned about the the workforce um, at an early age. Dad didn't really hire anybody when he started Duck Commander. There were no employees except for us. And so he was very thankful he had four boys because he was like, oh, this is per this is perfect work crew. So at an early age, we started working. This was child labor, if you're, if you're wondering, <laughs> it was. And the problem was he never paid us any money. Like we never got cash. So he would sell us on like, what about the electricity? What about, you know, it was like the food you eat, you know, somebody's got to pay for this. You're helping pay. So I understand that now. And I was like, oh, it's a great lesson, but I still wanted some cash. You know, I needed some money. And so in fourth grade, uh, I started what was officially my first business. I did some other stuff before, but I dabbled in things. But in fourth grade, I went, I launched my first business, which was Willie's Worm Farm. Um, and so we lived, so it's a, the same house that's on Doug Nasty. So it's the dead end road at the mouth of a creek that, that comes out of the Ouachita River. And so mostly growing up, we were commercial fishermen. So the duck call, like dad only sold a couple of them. But mostly how we earned our living was through fishing. And dad had hundreds of nets that he would run throughout the week. And then we would take the fish and we would take them uh, to town to sell them, um, which is where I kind of got my sales thing because Jace was older than me. So Jace was the motor man. So he would run the motor for Phil. They would go out super early, do the fish. They'd come in. Uh, we would load the fish up in the truck. I'm talking about in tubs with fish like flopping and we would just load them up and then I would go with mom into town to actually sell them. So I actually learned more about sales from selling these fish. And so we would start hitting fish markets. So we would hit one at the foot of the bridge and then we'd go to into Monroe and there was another one. So we would try to just sell them to the markets. That was the easy way. But 
But every few weeks, we would have fish left over. So then we'd have to take them to the street. We'd have to put a sign up, fresh fish, like super fresh, like you got to clean them fresh. And we would just stand there and sell these fish and people would come by. And, and so that's how I kind of got a knack for that. So uh, I, I thought, well, I can sell worms because we had the we have a boat dock. So my granny, who also had the mental illness, but she also owned the boat dock, which I thought was the most beautiful business ever. So she we poured this concrete into the creek and she put a mailbox up and it said one dollar. And so you put a dollar in uh, in the little hole. So she had this business and I thought, well, I need to sell worms because the fishermen would need worms. And so Dad had this old boat that had, like, he would make his own boats, which is amazing how he figured out how to do that. But there was these wooden boats. One had a hole in it. So I said, Dad, can I have this boat? So I put it up on two sawhorses. And I said, Dad, what, you know, did I just put dirt? And he says, uh, worms love cow manure. And I'm like, ah, oh, shucks. Well, a mile up the road was a cow pasture. So I will bear, we didn't have any buggies or, and I wasn't driving at the time, although I was driving probably pretty quickly after that, fourth grade. And so I would wheelbarrow the cow manure and I would just dump. I mean, one mile there, one mile back. One, <laughs> I just had my little wheelbarrow. I put some cornmeal in it and then just went and found hundreds of worms. And I would sit out there every Saturday morning, like at daylight. And I'd have my little sign, five cents a piece. And I would sell these worms. It was a decent business. Checkout was a nightmare. Yeah, you know, it just took a while to find it. <laughs> you know, give me 40, you know, like, that may take a second. And so I'm in there just scratching like a squirrel, you know, trying to find, and I had all these cans. So I would save all of the corn can, any, any kind of metal can I would save. And I had them all stacked up and, uh, but I knew I was destined for something better. I said, I could, I can do better than this. This is just what I had at the time. And then in fifth grade, Fifth grade was the big, that was actually the the biggest year. That's where my whole career turned. Everything happened in fifth grade. That was grade. the moment. That was the moment. Yeah, it was, that's where I knew, like the light shined on me. We had this dude come down to the house. So we always had these guys coming down to the house to talk to Phil. Usually they wanted a duck call or they had a duck call. They wanted Phil to work on it. And so, and, and you could just drive up to the house and Phil would just sit there because he was making duck calls all day. And and he would just chit chat and, and they'd pay cash, which was cool. And, uh, and so this guy came up and he said he was a candy distributor. And I didn't know what, and I just, I was, you know, young and I was like, what is a distributor? What is that? And he goes, well, I sell the candy to the gas station that you end up buying and they mark it up. They're a retailer. And so I'm like, that's brilliant. I was, so my mind was turning. And then as he left, he handed dad a box of, of bubble gum, hubba bubba bubble gum. And he said, here, this is for the boys. And so, so Phil just, you want to talk about right place at the right time. He just turned and handed it to me. He said, here, this is for the boys, which I, he was, you know, I was like, oh, I'll take that as I'm the boy and I got it. So it's mine, you know? So I take this gum and I just laid it on my bed. I just stared at it. I just, I didn't know what to do. It was like, you know, it's like Lord of the Rings. It was my precious. I was just looking at like, you know, I, I just, I, I thought, do I just chew this whole box of gum in one day? You know, that'd be amazing. But I decided then to sell that gum. I said, I'm going to be my own retailer. I'm going to be like the gas station, but I'm mobile. So I can go to school and I'll take it right to the people. Now the school didn't uh i don't think they even allowed chewing gum they certainly didn't sell it so i saw an opportunity real quick i thought this is the place to be because you know and this is john this is a country country school like it we were probably how, how many kids I, I haven't heard how many kids in your school at the time well i had probably 12 in my class so i don't know how big the I'm not small. good at math. There was eight grades. <laughs> so it was a fairly small school. But the key was there wasn't a lot of stores around. And so, man, when I when I brought this hubba bubba, oh John, they just it just it flew. I mean, like, like I went from a quarter a piece and then next day raised it to 50 cents a piece. Yeah, I, I knew how much money they had because they would get sent with a certain amount of money. And so I was like, I can get all the money before they ever get to the concession stand. Concession stand didn't open until 2.30. It was right before school ended. Well, by the time that happened, they're, they're out. So I went and I bought even more candy, more gum. I All the books went out my locker. I put shells in my locker and I just had food products, gum. <laughs> I'm dealing. I mean, I'm making a fortune. I'm making hundreds of dollars. Um, and I really found my calling. I was like, this is what I was, you know, I'm a good salesman. And so if you get the right product at the right time, get the right audience. And I said, man, I was... 
moving and shaking. Uh, eventually, the principal uh, called me in his office. <laughs> so I walk in the office and he goes, Willie, are you selling candy and gum out of your locker? And I said, yeah. And I thought he was going to like be proud of me or like off. Yeah, I didn't know if he wanted me to teach a class on it or like, because I was like, you got a real opportunity here, you know. But he was not. He was actually telling me that he was going to shut me down uh, because the concession stand had just met with him. And they were like, we're not selling anything. We don't know what like we just, we literally are not selling anything at the school. And then somebody ratted me out and said, Willie, he's done. He's done. Sold him all the stuff. And he's selling gum, you know, which was just frowned upon. And man, I didn't know what I was going to do. It was my first run in with the government. And, you know, and I realized in order to make money, the, the government, you got to it's you got to be tricky with these people because they will shut you down. And so I did some other stuff. Never was as lucrative as the candy and gum. Um, I sang songs on the school bus. I did this thing called the human jukebox um, where I would sing a song for a quarter, made some money. There it was decent. But actually. To circle back, I was on Mass Singer a year or two ago, and I actually told that story about that human jukebox and singing those songs. And so I guess it was on Fox and all over the all over the world. I was on the show singing and making money. So I, I was able to do it for a little more money. But yeah, I had these jobs. In fifth grade, also, I met who would end up being my business partner for life. I met my wife, Corey, in fifth grade at summer camp, um, at a Christian summer camp. Which was again back to the story right. of faith. When when mom and dad became believers and all that, our life totally changed. All of a sudden, we started going to church. We had never done that before. And then also, they'd take us out to this summer camp, and which was new for us. It was a Christian camp, and and mom never had enough money to actually pay for us to go to the camp. So we would, this is actually horrible. So mom would pull up, we'd be like in the station wagon. She'd say, all right, boys, we'd be packed like ready to roll. And she'd say, we didn't fill out the forms and we ain't got no money. So y'all stay in the car. I'm going to go see if I can trade me working in the kitchen for y'all to be able to come. If it works out, you can stay. If it doesn't, we're going back <laughs> home. So we were like in the car, like for an hour with our bags, like, please say yes, please say yes. <laughs> and every year they would they would let mom trade her cooking for, for us to go to camp. But that's where I met Corey. So I'm walking down. I see this girl in a swing. She's got this giant hair. And I'm like, who is that? And they're like, that's Corey Howard. And her grandpa is the one who actually built the camp. They were super successful at business, which was amazing. And I was like, wow, you know, and I said, I'm going to ask her. We had this thing called the moonlight hike. And I said, I'm going to ask her on the hike. And so I walked up to her and I said, you want to go on the moonlight hike with me? My name's Willie and um, uh, Willie Jess. And, uh, and she said, uh, yeah. And so we went on the moonlight hike. Uh, I believe I kissed her on the cheek uh, at the end of it. And that's where that relationship started. We didn't get married that year because I was just in fifth grade, but we waited. Until, <laughs> it wasn't long after, we, man. We thought about it. You know, it is Louisiana. So, that you know, we we, <laughs> uh, we did wait till we were. And we actually didn't even date after that. We kind we ended up going to the same church. And so I, I took her out a couple of times, but we never really. It wasn't until she was a senior when I asked her out. And then when I asked her out, she was a senior in high school. And the next year we got married. So. You're young, man. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful story, but you are young. She's 17, you're 18. You asked this girl to marry you. I think you tied or taped the ring in a bowling shoe, which is yeah, the, wow. the epitome That's of rom big, romantic. Sir. So you, you had that going for you. Well, and also John heard, and now here's the, here's the thing. Her dad was not happy about it. We, we did not share it. Oh, Cause that, this sucker even that's he, part of the redemptive story is like this guy who wanted nothing really at that point to do with you maybe your family no he didn't uh john he didn't have the vision that i had at the time he was uh definitely not seeing the potential that i had <laughs> so he, he asked me he said where exactly so he comes so we're gonna have the talk right we gotta have the talk and Corey's not even here today she went to college and so we're going to have this talk. And so I called, I said, hey, your dad said he wants to have this talk. But I know the answer is no. So I know he's going to say no. And so uh, it was pretty adversarial. And I thought he was going to hit me. I, th I really thought he was going to punch me, which if you know the guy, he's not that kind of guy. But I was like, <clears throat> I just really pushed his buttons. And so finally he gets all mad. He, he comes over, he brings all these papers. He's got like files and statistics. And, you know, he's wowing me with like, 
you should wait till this and you should have this much money in the bank. You know, he's giving me all this stuff. You know, I'm not interested in hearing it. And finally, he just goes, where exactly do you want to live? Where are you going to live with my daughter if you get married? And thinking I didn't have an answer. And to, now this one I felt bad about. So I popped off and I said, well, I reckon I'll pull a trailer behind Phil's house and we'll live there for free. That is not the answer this dude wanted to hear. I mean, <laughs> I mean these, they lived in a neighborhood, like, you know, posh and had a yard and <clears throat> all the stuff we didn't have. Like they had multiple vehicles and Corey would go in there to her dad and she'd be like, hey, we want to order pizza. And he would just shuck a $20 bill. I, it, to this day, I, st I just remember seeing going, who has $20 bills? Just, like on the rent, he just, there was always one in there. And I was like, <laughs> man, you know, cause when I go to my mom, it's like, hang out, you know, it's like we're counting change out. And this dude's like $20, you know? And I was always like, do you keep the change on that? Like who gets, like, cause mom would be, mom would follow me up like the IRS. Like, Hey, I gave you that $5. Where's the change? I'm like, crap, you know? So I'm digging in my pocket. So that was not the answer he wanted to hear, but we ended up pushing through, we got married and we were driving to the wedding. And he said, you know, Willie, I said what I thought I should say. And at this point, you guys are getting married. You'll never hear another word about it. And to this day, I never have. And a few years ago, well, actually about 10 years ago, I hired him. So he worked for me for several years, which was, that's actually the ultimate on your father-in-law is when you actually can hire them. So the guy that he didn't think was going to really amount to anything, and then you end up hiring him and then he works for you. Cause technically I worked for him before <laughs> I worked for him. Then he worked for me and uh, we've had a great relationship and he lives about, I would say a pitch and wedge away from where I live now. And, and when we got married, I said, I'm never living on that street, you know, and I was still mad over some things. <laughs> so, uh, but now we're all like, we live literally right beside each other. And uh, yeah, she's got a great family. We shared that same faith base uh, because they went to church and loved the Lord, but they were so good at business. And in fact, a lot of what I learned and well, most of what mm -hmm. I learned in business, I learned from them. As far as running a business, they did retail. In fact, they they owned the publishing company that was that was Howard Publishing it was a publishing company they started that was bought by Simon and Schuster out of New York. When Corey and I did our first book after Duck Dynasty, it was published by Howard Books. It was actually published by the company that her dad and grandpa amazing. started, which was amazing how it all circled around. So. So I'm, I'm going to try to circle around a little bit as you and Corey are growing and trying to remain married and trying to do life together. Eventually you come back home and you work with your, your parents, a duck commander. Mm -hmm. What were you hoping to achieve? Like th this is a small family business and this yeah. is before the dynasty is anywhere near being built. There's no foundation yet. What was the goal back then? Just to make a living. I mean, I wanted to make a living, do something. I thought it was cool to, to for what dad started. I thought I could do some things that he had, he had done the heavy lifting to actually get some of the ideas and get the stuff. And so when I came back to work for dad, I kind of just watched him and I tried for the first year or two, I just traveled with him. So I was kind of like his little assistant and he would get up and speak. And then I would sell the calls in the back of the room or wherever it was at. And I would set them up and sell them, but I would just watch how people reacted to him and even the product. And I was like, wow, there's such a connection. Cause Phil would get up and he would talk about ducks and he would talk about the duck calls, but then he would just go into his faith. And I don't care where he was at, how big the crowd was. He would just go into how bad he was and how his life turned around. And he all, he just, he never got away from that. He just felt like he said he was so bad. He just had a lot of making up to do as far as telling others. And so I think he, he would see people in his, in the same spot he was in. He just had such a a love and compassion for them and just wanted to tell them in this bold way. And so I just knew there was a connection. And as far as business goes, I knew he just, there were some things that he hadn't made the right connections. Like he made his duck calls. He was very mysterious. Like no one knew exactly who he was. He was like this big bearded guy who kind of was a preacher and, uh, but he never networked. He never showed up to anything. He never shook hands or, or had partnerships or anything. And so I was able to make the connections, partner up with other companies, which eventually that's where the show ended up coming out of was through partnerships. And so I partnered up with a camouflage company, a shotgun company, a shell company. So I was able to bring in money for that and products, which dad thought I'd, he thought I'd 
genius. He was like, wow, there's this new money coming in. And because it was really small. I mean, there's probably four of us down there working and just made those right connections. And then out of that, Benelli Shotguns actually came to us and said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing a, a TV show? And it was interesting, John, because my wife, so Corey watched reality TV. And so she says, Willie, y'all should do a show. And I was like, what kind of show? She said, a reality show. I said, Corey, we're just normal people. Like, and she goes, Willie, y'all aren't normal. Like, there's nothing normal about y'all. And I was like, really? Do you think they're, you know? And she goes, believe me, yeah. And again, because with her family, they, they were more normal people in business and all that. And it was like a month later after she said that, Benelli approached us and says, hey, would you guys be interested in doing a TV show? We'll put it on the Outdoor Channel. We want to feature our shotguns, but we also want to, it, you know, it can be reality, but hunting. And I said, my wife just said we should do something like that. And so I go to dad and I'm like, dad, hey, this Benelli wants to do a TV show. And he's like, ah, that's a terrible idea. You know, and he goes, oh, there ain't nothing extraordinary about us. And I said, well, we, we make it sell more duck calls, you know, and we make it use it for a platform, you know. And so he begrudgingly agrees <laughs> to doing the show. And it was really successful. Like it, it really was very successful. Our sales went up and it was great. It kind of gave us enough training because we had been filming videos. So we'd been around video right. just enough. Now we're doing this small show in this niche market that uh, kind of helped. And then from that show, a producer in Los Angeles, I, was, I think he was working out and he's watching Outdoor Channel. He sees our show and he's like, whoa, you know, who are these guys? And he's like, man, that could be a big show. And so he emails me to the general information box at Duck Commander. Hey, this is, you know, so-and-so production. I think you have a big show on your hands. Give me a call. Leave his phone number. And then the secretary brings it in. She's holding the email. She goes, Willie, there's some guy in LA. He's talking about a TV deal. Do you want me to chunk it? Do you want me to respond? But that was the moment. It was it was almost like that box of hope. I was like, I've got an email. This is something that could be. And I said, I'll respond. And I and so I sent him back and said, Hey, it's Willie. I don't know what you had in mind, but um, and then we got on the phone and we talked for probably 30 minutes. And man, he was a fast talker. He was like a classic LA guy, you know, and he was like, Willie, this is, this show could be huge. And he said, Willie, you'll be so famous. You won't be able to walk down the street without pe everybody knowing who you are. And I thought this guy is so full of crap. <laughs> I was like, like what, on what planet could this actually happen? And we made a little sizzle reel, showed it around, a and &E picked it up and here we go. The rest yeah, is history. But that's how it came about as far as actually being on TV and making that show. Really, we could spend an entire podcast talking about the show and run out of time. It's, it's, <laughs> dude, we could spend an hour talking about you wrestling in, in the backyard area. Like there, there's so many hilarious episodes, but rather than talking about the episodes or the hundreds of millions of people who watch them, or that you can't walk down the street without someone saying you look just like Willie Robertson <laughs> and all the time, man, you know, that guy's weird too. Instead of that, man, is there a story that whether it was on a street or on an airplane or in the back of a speech where someone said like, dude, you, you need to know the impact that that little show had on me or my family or my son? Is there a letter that you received? Something that just stands out is if it was only for this one, I'm glad we did it. John, there's so, there actually is so many. There's just tons and tons of People, uh, you know, some of the things that, um, and sadly, I forget, like, I just forget, it was such a fast ride, I forget so much, and that's why I'm glad the people that are with me and run around with me, they'll remember these things that I totally forgot, I'm like, oh, I totally forgot about that, or somebody will come up to me and tell me something, but it happens all the time. So I never realized the impact that you would have really on, like, Make-A-Wish kids, and so many people come to me also and say, we, me and my grandpa when he was dying or my father or my mother, we would watch Duck Dynasty in those last weeks of their life. It was one of their favorite shows. It's one thing that they could, that we could watch together. And it was the only thing that could bring them laughter, you know, in that moment. And it's those times I'm thinking, wow, it was worth it. All those days, you know, I was probably griping and complaining about sitting out there all day. I remember the first make a wish kid where I had this, like we had just started and I didn't, honestly, I didn't know a whole lot about even programs like that. And uh, I got a call from 
uh, someone, she said, Hey, there's, there's a girl. And I mean, basically her last wish is to meet you, uh, which is so humbling and just amazing. And the way we were filming, we only, we were filming six days a week. And so the only time I could go was on a Sunday. That was our day off. And so I flew up to Louisville. There's a children's hospital, I can't remember the name of it, but, um, so I had to, I was going to fly up that morning and fly back that afternoon, literally in one day. So I'm all ready and I walk in the room and, and what I visually see <clears throat> was so jarring and striking because it was like the family, but the the girls, she's probably nine years old. And I remember I just teared up and I just said, I'll be right back. <laughs> so I walked in the room and then walked right back out of the room. And so I'm standing out there just crying in the hallway. And But then I was thinking, you know, They've been, this family has been crying for who knows how long everybody's been crying. So I know there's been crying in here and this was not the time to cry. It was not the time because I know what she wanted to see. She wanted to see the guy she saw on TV. Yep. It's funny and who was fun and that that's who she wanted to see. And so, so I got it together. And I was like, okay, you know, so I walked back in and I'm like, what is up, you know, and I was like, and just went through the whole routine, and I talked about Uncle Si, and we just <laughs> laughed, and and she laughed, and the family was laughing, we just had this great moment, so that was on Sunday, she passed away on Thursday of that mm. same week, so, and I remember they sent me the message, and saying she passed away, and it was so, it so hit me, I was like, wow, and then I, you know, because I think when you get into this, you don't even think about that, like, there's no playbook there's no like this is how it's going to be this is how you're going to impact people and so that was one of many children just of of all the the times that you know uh, of the conversations that I've been able to have from airplanes to where people were I, I got a note yesterday at a restaurant and it was actually it was a note that a girl gave me that wanted me to give it to Sadie you know my our daughter who speaks all over the world and and she just wrote it out. And it was just so just inspiring, just like I was suicidal and I was all this. But I listened to the podcast and I listened to this message. It gave me hope. It gave me just wanted her to know. And so and I kept that napkin. I gave it to Sadie actually last night. And I said, here, read this. You know, this is a message that someone wants to give you. There's so many fun things and funny things that have happened. But man, there's a lot of inspiration, too. And just a lot of just a lot of moments that have that have happened. I've been able to share my faith uh a lot through it. It's a great gateway. It's a great door opener for people to ask about. And again, I just think about Phil and I think about somebody taking that chance and and sharing with him. And no matter how far gone you are, I just think you never know who that person's going to be, or you never know who that person's going to be that you, that doesn't look like they're going to amount to anything, but then they end up through their family. And I remember I, I, I baptized a guy a few months back and I said, your kids are this could really change your kids' lives. And he said, Willie, I don't have any kids. I said, yeah, but you may one day. And this like this moment, oh. this can help change that life because actually that's what I saw happen through us. And then being able to pass that down now to the next generation to where of my family where that can continue on. And Sadie just had her conference here in, in Monroe. So I spent all weekend serving it was for it was a ladies conference and so it was all these women and so just being down here and watching her uh she completely filled up the civic center here in monroe with people and uh <clears throat> yeah man just watching that happen and and that keep going just all from that you know again i can trace it back to there and then the opportunities that we have and so it just provides hope and it provides life with meaning and mission and just something more and if you don't have faith I just I really don't know how people get through you know I don't know it mm -hmm. just seems like things will be lucky either you're lucky or you're not lucky or it's just how the dice roll and so man I just I believe there's something bigger and I believe that I just draw so much from that and can you know and then no matter what happens in life man it, it certainly helps it give it meaning at least for me and at least for us and our family. I, I sort of over prepare for these interviews and and I certainly did for this one. I, I, at the end of my list of questions, I have about 72 to ask you. We've done three so far. Uh, <laughs> I, I have the, the records one, by the way, a uh, guy had 38 questions and he asked one question. <laughs> so, and we well, we're in that, at least uh, I got 10 quotes, but only one that I'd like to put in front of you again. And, and just because you keep hovering all around this thing and it, it it's these beautiful words you said, I want to turn darkness into light one conversation at a time. 
Oh, yeah. Tell me why that matters to you. Well, the book I just wrote that's coming out in the spring, it's called Gospeller. And that's the tagline, turning uh, darkness into light, one conversation at a time. The inspire, I think you've heard the heart from that is, is certainly from my life. And actually the first chapter, I, I talk about that story and talk about how I've seen that. And so we all have conversations, John, with people and most of them are just nothing. But it's amazing how we do, we, you know, I think we, we in some ways long for community and long to talk to people and long to make that connection. Uh, and so we ask questions. And so I try to get it around if there's a problem, if there's something that people have questions or, have, or something's going on in their lives, I, I feel like I have the answer. As the Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. And so I have hope. And so if someone sees me and I don't want them to just go, oh man, well, he's a fun guy. He seems like he's got it together. And I guess everything's worked out. There's a reason for that. There's something that's coming out of me that's different. And because it's not naturally who I am, I'm naturally probably rude and selfish and all these I mean all these things are kind of are in me naturally but there's something living in me that's different and so the spirit of God that lives in me hopefully comes out and the fruit of that could be you know is, is love and joy and peace and patience kindness and these things should flow out of my life and so if they do it's just a reflection of the light that has impacted me the light that impacted my father's the light that impacted my mother to give her the ability to forgive a guy who she had no business even forgiving that's all that light it's the light that i see in my kids that they have and even in this crazy world of that's full of darkness and full of pain and just watch the news good grief if <laughs> that doesn't depress you and so it's almost set up for that and so but where we see light is we're like, oh, that's light. And and so you can be drawn to that light and people can be drawn to that. And so as I have conversations with people, I always look for that, look for those moments. So I was in the car with this guy, John, and I tried to share faith with him for years. And he was so resistant. <laughs> he would always say like, uh, he who hath not sinned cast the first stone. I think he felt like I was like coming at him with this religious thing. And I really didn't. I just wanted to say, hey, man, if you got like I was nervous about like something that he may not, they may die prematurely with this thing he had. And we were driving in a car. We were in New York City and and we'd just been to a business meeting. So we were talking about all this business stuff. And he was so excited. He was talking about money and how much money we can make and all this. And I looked at him and I just I said, man. I think you may be dead in 14 years. And that's just what I said. And he just looks at me and he goes, what? I'm like, I don't know. How old are you? And I ask his age and he looks and he goes, I've never thought about that. And I said, well, maybe you should think about it. Like we're all going to die. Right. And so we don't know when that is. And I just threw a number out and he goes, man. And then he got all bothered. He said, I need to hear more about this. He didn't say he who had not sinned cast. He, he finally dropped that one. <laughs> now I got him to thinking about his own life and his mortality and what that meant. And he invited me up to his hotel room. And I just shared with him some scriptures and shared with him about his life. And we talked about it. And he said, I think I'm going to give my life to God. I, I, th I need to be baptized. <laughs> he actually stood up and he said, I'm getting baptized. And so he waited. It was like a month later. He called me. He said, all right, I'm ready. He had invited everybody he knew, which was like tons of people. And I go to his house and there's just people everywhere. And he goes, Willie, tell him what you told me in that hotel room. And so I got up to this big group of people. And then I actually just share with them the gospel. And so he goes down and he's got this pond. He's got all set up. And, he, and so I, I baptized God. It was so beautiful. And he goes, anybody else? And John, people just start streaming in that water, like blue jeans, shirts. There was 25 people that day that came in. I still run into people around the country like, I was there that day, you know, or you baptized me that day. I was just amazing. And that's where I knew, that's where you can, that's where you can turn that darkness to light, just from one conversation, from one question. That would happen to be just bringing up that the guy's going to pass away and he just hadn't, he was living his life and he just hadn't thought about what happens there? And, and actually, he was a wealthy guy. And I just said, you've invested a lot in this life. But I said, man, we're gone. Like, somebody's going to split up your stuff and they'll sell your house and it'll be gone. And I mean, in a generation, you can just be forgotten. I mean, I don't think my kids can call the names of my my grandparents. to. I don't know that they know their names even. 
And that's how quickly things are here and then they're gone, man. Life is short. And so uh, like the girl I talked about, like the girl I saw, that was a Sunday and she passed on Thursday. So, man, I look for, I hope there's more meaning in it than just, you know, the luck of the draw. And so I'm putting my faith in Jesus and uh, trying to have those conversations. I've written that book, that story's in there. And uh, there's a lot of stories just about stories where it's just casual when we talk. And so some people want to accept it. Some people don't. And that's fine, too. And I'm not the judge. I'm just a messenger. I'm a duck call seller who, you know, God has smiled on us. And I just want to share that with others. We have a few questions that wrap up all of our interviews. There's seven rapid fire questions. So here we go. Willie Robertson. Question number one, what's been the most impactful book you've ever read? Oh, man, I'd, I'd have to say the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Is there ever a, 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 a book within the Bible that would you, you would say, man, it's it's this book within the Bible? Uh, it'd have to be the book of Acts. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's my favorite book. Yeah, it's right after the Gospels and right before the letters. And it's really where we see these interactions between people. And that's why I love it. I love just like the interaction I just told you about with the guy in the car. Like we see those kind of moments, you know, and Jesus is not here. Jesus has already left. So same boat we're in now. So, yeah, the book of Acts for sure. What, what's one positive characteristic that you possess as a kid that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Probably innocence, I guess, being like an innocent kid where you don't think about all the negative stuff. If your home caught fire and your children and their children and your animals and your bride and your parents, everybody's out safe and you have an opportunity of running in and grabbing one thing that matters, what's the one thing you come racing back outside with? Probably my, probably a specific Bible. I know I hate to keep saying that, but I also have at this point in time right now, I have some cash in that Bible. <laughs> so I had it in the Bible because <laughs> I figure he's going to steal a Bible. <laughs> so I have a little cash in there right now. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go move it because now somebody <laughs> knows going to listen to this going like, I knew he had that. Bible. Where is Monroe, West Monroe, Louisiana? Let's go find it. All right, Willie, if you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone, living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? Oh, man, that's too hard. I'd say the Apostle Peter. I think I, there's a lot of questions I have for him. But when I, I'm, I when I get to have it, I'm afraid the line's going to be long like for him. So I'm probably going to go to Philip, who's actually in the book of Acts, because I think the line may not be as long. So I'm already thinking, like, I've, I've got this mapped out. Like, is it going to be a super long line for, like, Jesus, obviously. And so I'm like, who who got to circle back to? <laughs> and like, I'm going to hit them and then come back to ultimately Jesus. But there's a lot of people that I would like to chit chat with for sure. What's the best advice you've ever received? Give more than you take. What advice would you give yourself at age 20? At 20, I would say, don't over panic over these things. Like this, it's a long road, man. At 20, I, I don't even know what I was thinking, but I remember thinking like it was so like life or death at the moment. And now I don't even remember what exactly that is. So just at 20, I'd say, hey, be patient, man. And it's never wasted. I feel like at 30, I was like, man, I think I've wasted my life. And I, was, <laughs> I hadn't even started. Like Duck Dynasty didn't start till I was 40. Wow. Duck Dynasty didn't start from... Phil and Kay and Cy, so they were in their mid-60s. So you think about people, like their life, I think they had thought, that's it. We've done everything. And man, there was a whole new life opened up. So I, I feel like sometimes we think like, crap, I missed it. I missed the boat. I didn't get started early enough or whatever on this or that. And who knows what, what you could do, man. You just got to get up and do it. Willie Robertson, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? I would say he was on fire. He lived in awe and he lived inspired. Oh, hang on. Was that all your stuff? Dude, <laughs> your own taglines, man. Have you trademarked did that? Because I like all of them. <laughs> actually, I, I would take that. I would actually, I would think in some ways, I think you'd want to live like a kid, you know, and uh, there's that. Man, that I just love that thought. And then being on fire for something, you know, I mean, for me, it's on God and on the gospel. And yeah, and be inspired. I, I love those, John. You had some great ones. Probably gospeler. Gospeler means one who shares their faith either publicly or personally. And so 
you know, I'd like to be known for that. It's just is is always just having the good news right there where you could have it. Uh, you know, and doing it. Don't take yourself too seriously. Good grief. I think there's so much pain and damage and stuff you've gone through. People, I mean, it's just like, it's so sad. We could either just cry and be sad all the time, or we can, I think the Robertson, we found some way to kind of smile and laugh at things and even hard things. And it's just a funner way to live life, I think. So, Willie, my friend, thank you for helping turn darkness into light one conversation at a time, starting with this one. It was so good to see you again and hear your voice and hear your joy. That's the most contagious thing that I feel every time I see you, hear you, or I'm with you, just the joy you have for life. So brother, I love you. Nothing you can do about it. And thank you for joining us on the Live Inspired channel. Love you, buddy. My friends, that is Willie Robertson. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Well, my friends, I told you on the front side of the conversation that you were going to love this one. And I think as you tuned in and got all the way through it, you agree with me now. Isn't he awesome? I love learning about the early stages of Willie's entrepreneurship from selling gum to classmates, how about that, to live worms to fishermen. It's kind of no wonder that he achieved so much success in his life as a business leader when it started so early from such humble beginnings. If you enjoyed today's episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you, I think you're going to love our entrepreneur playlist. You'll discover invaluable insights and inspiring lessons from former Starbucks president, Howard Bihar, it's one of my favorite episodes, Netflix co-founder Mark Randolph, another great episode, Hent Waters CEO Kara Golden, another great episode, and so much more. You can check that out where our playlist is at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. I'll have a link in the show notes directly into the entrepreneur playlist, and you won't want to miss it. Well, my friends, as you begin your adventure forward from this journey today, I want to thank you again for being part of our Live Inspired podcast community. I want to thank you for believing, like I do, that the foundation is firm. Yes, the headwind is real, but the best is yet to come. So for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Helians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at keelycompanies.com.